The Women of Ill Repute, with your hosts, Wendy Mesley and Maureen Holloway. So, Wendy, you've heard of the, the cult of busyness, haven't you? The cult? I don't know. Busyness, maybe. What do you mean, though? Busyness. It's like, you know, virtue signaling. If you ask someone how they're doing and they complain and they say, oh, I'm crazy busy or I'm stupid busy. And it's it's either to convey how necessary they think they are to the universe or also as a way of saying I can't get together with you or both. Yeah, well, it's making me think of Steve Green. So a thousand years ago, I was one of the presenters at what used to be called the Gemini's or not the screen awards or whatever they are. You got a load of them. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have four, which is not very many for someone who was around as long as me. I was nominated for one. (laughs) I was nominated for one, but and I have a pin, but we digress. Go on. What did Steve Green say to you? Yeah, so I was presenting and I was backstage. I was whining to him. I'm just so busy and I'm so stressed out because we just bought this house and we bought this piece of land and I've got a one-year-old and oh my God, I'm just so... And he goes, gee, you must like being stressed. And I'm like, you're an asshole. (laughs) Come on, feel sorry for me, but yeah. (laughs) Oh, my country home takes up so much of my time. But everybody is crazy busy at some point in their lives. Like no matter, especially if they're a working parent of younger children, it's it's not a badge of honor. It's it's a fact of life, right? And there's no business like show business. (laughs) I could go on, but you probably heard that one. Okay, all right, moving on. (laughs) I could sing more. Okay, so the point of all this is you have to try to find joy in the busyness of your life instead of complaining about it. I mean, kids, if you have them, and work, if you have it, and housework, because we all have that, and maybe school if you're still in it. And I also think you should throw a pastime, like a hobby or a sport, into the mix, something that you're passionate about. Otherwise, it is drudgery. Yeah, well, I mean, that, I guess that's the old saying, right? If you need to get something done, give it to somebody who's busy. So, But you're, you basically, you agree with that. You're saying if you're busy, get busier. Get busier. Okay, well, here's uh, here's an exercise. Name three occupations or roles or pastimes that you think define you in no particular order. Well, like on Twitter, I sort of describe myself as a very serious journalist person. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> well, because it was a big deal for me, but, you know, like... Why didn't I know? No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't... It's very serious, Maureen. <laughs> But yeah, I guess if you're going to get real, the things that really matter to me are being being a mother, now doing this podcast. And I have this sort of secret obsession of windsurfing, which was cool like in 1980. Why is it a secret obsession? There's no shame in it. Because it's private. Like everybody who windsurfs or does other surfing water thingy things knows that I windsurf. It's not a secret secret. It's just not something I'm comfortable sharing yet. I mean, I talk about everything else. But not windsurfing. You can ask her how often she has sex, but she won't talk about windsurfing. (laughs) Well, not that either, but you know. (laughs) What about you? How many times do you have sex, Maureen? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're way off topic here. Some people will tell you not enough, but that's another story. (laughs) I'm crazy busy. (laughs) (laughs) Three things that define me, I would say, well, podcaster, mother, uh, I spent a lot of time doing that. And then all the, you know, the cooking and the bad golfing, and the bad piano playing and the, I'm very busy. <laughs> I have a lot on my plate, but this is nothing compared to our guest this week. Yeah. Our guest is kind of amazing. I mean, she, we actually say that we do more than three, but she has three serious things. So she has a job as a nurse. She is the mother of five children. And recently she has become a stand up comedian. I worked in a nursing home. That was my primary. I worked in a nursing home for 15 years. It's creepy working night shifts. It's creepy. Taking care of a lot of old people. I learned a lot. I learned that racism is still alive, but dying at the same time. (laughs) There's a lot of old white people. Never. I'm like, what did you say? But I don't want nobody dying during my shift. So I'm like, Jesus is black. And they're like, no. A serious stand-up comedian. (laughs) Is there such a thing? Yes, I suppose so. I don't know, but we'll find out. Sabrina Douglas is from Brampton, Ontario. And yes, she is the mother of five active children. And yes, she is a nurse and a stand-up comedian who tours and everything. 
and she is rightfully crazy busy. So we're thrilled that she found a moment to stop and tell us why and how she does it all. That's you laughing in the background. Welcome, Sabrina Douglas. Thanks for having me. Let's start with growing up in Brampton. So your parents are from Jamaica. Oh, yeah. Did you have a normal childhood, would you say? Uh, Whatever that is. What is normal, exactly. But I don't think it's normal only because I'm now a stand-up comedian and I talk about it. So, But I do, because of my stand-up comedy, I do like use it. I use it to vent. I'm not going to lie. I use comedy to vent. And because of that, I've met a lot of people who can relate to me. I always think that, like, I'm the only one, but people will come up to me after shows and be like, oh, my God, my parents are exactly the same. (laughs) So, like. Well, that's what worked for Russell Peters. (laughs) Yeah. Russell Peters talks about his mom. Me and Maureen talk about our moms all the time. We're a little bit obsessed and influenced, overly influenced by our mothers. And I've seen you do an impersonation of your mother. So are Jamaican moms different? Yeah. I'll do impersonation of my parents and then other Jamaicans are just like, yeah, yeah, I totally relate. And then some white people will laugh at it, but sometimes they look very nervous. Uh, but, yeah. And I'm like, don't worry, we're used to this. <laughs> it looks a little abusive from the outside, but it's great material. Jamaican mothers are different. I'm not going to lie. How so? Are they stricter or more outspoken or? Both. Very strict strict, very outspoken. There's a lot of things that when I was a kid, I had my white friends, they were allowed to do. And I'm like, you're allowed to do that? That's amazing. And the way sometimes I could never speak to my parents certain ways. And I'm just like, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just watch you do that with your parents. I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll just go clean my room. That's where I'm going to be. Yeah, we interviewed Marie Hannon, and she said that the way that you could tell a Canadian, because she took her white boyfriend, white Canadian boyfriend home to meet the parents, and her parents are a mix of Lebanese and a bunch of other things, and her parents were like, oh my God, like Canadian, he's so Canadian, like they have like the kids over who sit at the kitchen table, who sit at the dinner table with the adults. That's shocking. So I mean, I think every culture is so different, but it's so lovely to meet you. I mean, I'm always looking for the deep meaning in in things and and Maureen likes to to laugh. And I'm not. (laughs) And you do both. Like you save people's lives and you then make them laugh. So it's kind of cool. Sabrina, tell us about nursing. I mean, you're not just a nurse. You're still working as a nurse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because stand-up comedy doesn't pay the bills, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. And I always use it as a joke. And I'll be like, yeah, these seats are empty. Look like I'll be doing a night shift tonight. And people (laughs) laugh. And I'm like, oh, it's real. Like, you know. Well, you've been a, you were a frontline worker through the pandemic. Are you still working in a nursing home? No, I just say that on my sets. I work in the hospital. I just don't, I don't want it to be too real just because like, yeah, it's too much. But no. I used to work in the nursing home like years ago. Like I've been a nurse for 20 years, but I did do stand up for over 10 years. And when I started stand up, I had a really severe case of stage fright. I remember I started when I was 30. I was scared to speak in front of people. I wanted to get rid of that. And I found a workshop at Yuck Yucks and it was four Sundays to do stand up. And I'm like, if I try this and plus, you know, everybody tries stand up. They're like, oh, my friends think I'm funny. Maybe I can do it. So I tried it and I literally became obsessed and I went to every open mic in Toronto. But yeah, like I'm still still doing nursing. Like I don't, I honestly don't think it's crazy now. Like nursing is super insane. Like it's like the hardest job you could ever do right now. But like, I don't think I could ever stop nursing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I think, I, I don't know, it's just something, like, I actually came into the profession, like, liking what I'm doing. Like, there's some people who take jobs that they don't like and they hate it, but I hate the situation, but I don't hate nursing. Like, I don't hate the art of nursing. I just hate, like, the situation that we're working in. And, like, I kind of got to do it. And, like, I'm there and we're so short and it's hard. But then I still have, like, it's, Balance is, you were talking about balance and balance is so important. Like I still need to do my stand up, like honestly, to keep a balance. And then I'm like, okay, I can work now. And then even during the pandemic, when we had like 
and everything was shut down and comedy was just all Zoom calls. I still did it. I, w- I would work a shift and then go on break and I'll be like, okay, guys, I'll be back in 20 minutes. And then I'd be doing a set in the break room like, ha ha. Yeah, that guy's penis. Like, you know what I mean? And then these nurses are speaking about, what is she saying? <laughs> and I'd be saying, like, oh, And they'd introduce me, like, oh, there's this crazy comedian <laughs> calling from the hospital. Like, whatever, man. Like, I'm like, let me do a set. And then I'd come out. I'm like, I don't know what just happened, but I did a set. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, how do you figure it out? So some of it is so risque. I mean. We both lost our moms in the last little while, which is not funny, but I mean, we tend to find humor in everything, apparently. No, I, you can find humor in it. I mean, there's the, the truth of that. It's universal, right? I mean, I went in to see my, my mother died in Montreal in the middle of the pandemic, and suddenly she was in the hospital and things went south. And I hadn't seen her in a while. And it was fraught. But I remember being led into the ICU, all hazmatted up because of the pandemic. And I went in and she was she was in an induced coma. And I took her hand and I said, you look like hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mo. <laughs> and I knew that if anything, if she, anything would have brought her out, that would do it. She also would have killed herself laughing. Bad choice of words. But there is humor in everything. And I, I, I propose to you that you find humor in some of the darkest places in your nursing career. Oh, and it's so it's so funny because, like, I remember during the pandemic, like, we had people, like, in strict isolation for, like, 14 days. So no visitors are, like, in this isolation. You know, like, horrible that is. And then I'd come in and they're just like, thank you so much. Like, it's hard for me, like, before I'd be able to converse more, but we have to wear everything, you know? And then, like, you speak one word, and then your your goggles are, like, all fogged up. But, like, just, like, if I said a little thing and I made them laugh, they're like, I needed this. Like, thank you for, like, not being so serious. Like, you know what I mean? It just, it makes a big difference. Like, I'm not, I'm not crazy, though. I don't tell jokes to, like, people that are, like, actively dying. Be like, hey, look at your dad. Like, I'm not doing something like that. But, I'm, like, I always sneak in humor. But, like, people, like, even the nurses, like, if I go on a unit, they're just like, Sabrina's hair. Like, oh, are you going to tell some jokes? I'm like, no, we got to be serious today. They're like, no, we need you. Tell a joke. Like, you're just like, it's just honestly, we need it. Like, you need humor. It doesn't matter. My mom would have just loved you. She had a fall and she had dementia. And she got moved into one of those two-week isolation things. And it was horrible because if you don't know what's going on, she just starved herself, basically, to death. And then then you tell a joke. And I please don't tell my mother. She's not here. And I don't think she's listening. But you, you do a joke about shutting people's eyes. And I, like I went in, I went back like 15 minutes after she died. I was there. And it's so true. And it only happens in the movies that you can. And I'm like, can you please shut her eyes? And the nurse is going, um. <laughs> and then you turn that into a joke. I mean, it's... Uh, I don't know. Marin and I both had cancer, and I think we both told cancer jokes. We could have died, but it was funny. <laughs> All that <you> still do. <laughs> so how do you find the line, or you just go for it? You just sort of, like, you think it's funny? Oh, that's the comedy question. Where's the line? Oh, yeah. It, dep- it depends. Like, I don't, I don't go for it all. Like, it depends. If I'm doing a corporate clean gig, there's no way. I'm talking about closing somebody's eyes. Like if somebody's having a meal in their ball gown, no way. Like it depends. If I'm at a comedy club and people are like actively listening, they're drinking and I'm like, hey, let's see if I can sneak in some nursing home jokes. If I see they laugh a little, let me see if I could talk a little bit about death. If they laugh and I'm like, hey, guess what? You know, like it depends. Like if people are open to it, then yeah, sometimes they're not really open to it and not just make a joke about it. Like, oh, I guess you don't mind this. Uh, and then like, whatever. Like you just, but comedy, you have to just go for it or else like, what's the point? Comedians can't really censor themselves, you know? Like there's certain things you can't say, but still, you still have to try. Like you still have to try to get the gold. That's the only way. If you don't try it, like you'll never know, like if you have gold material. So five kids, five kids. <laughs> Where, well, you start with the first, and then the next thing you know, you've got five. Tell us about having five kids, and how old are they, and how do you do it? No, like, okay, so I have five kids because I did get remarried. So I had two from my previous marriage, and my husband has two, and we have one together. 
So just don't get remarried. <laughs> oh, it's yours, mine, and ours. Okay. Oh, no. Then like triple them? Yeah, no. But like for me now, because I have the five, I'm like it's perfect for my joke when I'm like, I have five kids. And some people are like, it depends. If it's young people, they're like, whoa. If it's old Jamaican people, they're like, so we have 20 kids. So like, what? <laughs> I, it depends who I'm talking to if they really care. But like, I'll just be like, I have five kids. And I'm like, I'm not even a comedian. I just literally just came out here to get away from them. And people like that stuff, you know? So I just use it as a shock value. But like, yeah, my oldest one is like 19. And then I have a 16 year old and the step is uh, 17. And then I have a seven year old. And then we have like the five year olds. So, <laughs> But when they're all together, honestly, like, it's helped so much because our like it's a blended family. Blended families are so challenging as it is. Okay, but like, and then you get the thing like, mm, I'm, you're not my mom. You know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm like, well, I'm a comedian. I'm going to make fun of you later. So like, you know. Yeah, who's in charge? What are the rules? I'm, I'm sure you've got it all figured out. <laughs> Well, about that, all right, about that, my youngest son was over yesterday, he's 24, and he said, you can, he said, you can't talk about me. And I said, I've been talking, that's why I had you, <laughs> so that I'd have material. And he said, well, it's okay now, because I'm an adult. He said, but when I was a kid, it was embarrassing. Some of the things that you would talk about on the air were really embarrassing. And I was like, well, too bad. <laughs> Enjoy your steak dinner. <laughs> Yeah, that's what parents are. Are We're basically here to embarrass our kids, and which is what we told our daughter. I know. Well, my kids, especially the oldest one, she's been to my shows and she doesn't really care, but she she just doesn't like, sometimes I'll focus and I'll be like, my daughter's right there. And I'm like, I love you. And she's like, oh my God, stop. All these people are staring. And I'm like, I can't help it. That mother, okay, I'll stop. I'll go back to the jokes. And she's just like, mom. <laughs> I know, but everything's grist for the mill, unfortunately. And I guess it's the little ones that, first of all, they don't care because they're not as aware. It's the teenage thing where you start mentioning anything about them. And it's like, oh, my God, it's horrifically embarrassing. Yeah, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I get it all the time. Even my last name, there aren't very many Mesleys in the world. And most, if you ever meet another one, they're probably related, even though that was my dad's name, didn't grow up with my dad. So I don't really know the Mesleys. But my daughter, she has my husband's last name. And part of that was because I wanted to protect her. So, you know, I talk about her all the time with close people, but I, I have always tried to keep her separate. So, and now that she's older, like I finally, like she started doing memes when she was like 15, 16, 17 and became quite popular with that. And, but I wasn't allowed to follow. And I, to me, I had to tell myself, it's a diary. Don't go there. Don't look. But I finally posted a picture of her at, she's 24, same age as Maureen's youngest. I finally posted my first picture of her on Twitter, but she was dressed up as Sunny for Halloween. So it so she's the picture of Sunny Bono. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the first one. It's the first time she's been on any social media. So it's hard finding that line of how to draw in your kids and what is your life and who are they and... Yeah. So what do you tell them about, like, what do you tell the little ones about? Well, mommy's going out because it's not for my job, it's for my other job. Well, I had one time I accidentally brought the little ones to a show because it, it was like after the pandemic and they said, oh, it's going to be in a park. So I thought, oh, there's going to be swings there. You guys, I took my husband. I'm like, you take them on the swings. I'm going to go do the show. But it was like a park in Toronto. So a park in Toronto is like like an artistic garden. I'm like, oh, and they're like, why'd you bring your kids? I'm like, I guess they're here to watch. But one of them went on stage and she's like, I want to tell a joke. And they're like, let her tell a joke. I'm like, whatever. And she's like, you know, she's the, the seven-year-old, the stepdaughter. She did it, told a joke. And everybody's, you know, all so sweet about it. And she was like, mom. She calls me Mommy V, and he's just like, this is, it's like it was my birthday. And I'm like, oh, no, your mom's going to be so upset at me. I just, I'm raising a comedian. <laughs> She's like, when are you going to do a show? Can I come and perform? And I'm like, I don't know. The Women of Ill Repute. What's your schedule like? I mean, how do you, obviously, your husband must help a lot. Oh, yeah. And my in-laws and my parents. Yeah, yeah. Everybody helps. There's no way I could do any of this stuff on my own. No way in a thousand years. No way. My parents, like, 
even though they were strict, but they love the fact that I'm going after being a comedian. But like <laughs> Jamaican parents are funny. They feel like, oh, comedy, TV, lots of money. <laughs> so they're just like, we'll watch the kids bring home the money. We'll watch. I'm like, okay, but I'm getting $20 for this open mic. Anyways, you don't need to know that. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> 20 bucks. Wow. <laughs> like, yes, you're going to become a star. You're going to become a star. And I'm like, yay, yay, yay. Like, they help me out so much. Like, honestly, especially my husband. Support is important. Yeah. Well, you couldn't do this. Like you said, I was thinking, I didn't realize there was a Mr. Douglas, uh, although I'm sure he's got a different name. But yeah, there's no way that you could go out at night and work a shift and still have a relationship with your kids unless you had help and so oh there's no way yeah like my husband's like so good he's like a a mom dad like he's so good like sometimes i get tired and i'm like oh i wanna and he'll he'll be there like he'll like you do the show and then like if i do a weekend he'll bring the kids to the hotel and he'll be out with them i do the do the show and i come out and join everyone later so yeah, I just have to make it work. That's all it is. I got to be picky and choosy. Like I'll choose cool gigs that like have like cool places where kids can like hang out too. Like I always think about that. So like we're all kind of always together and I just don't leave them all the time because the, it's the worst when I have to do road gigs and I'm by myself and I'm like, where's my kids? Why did I go? I hated this set. I hated those people. Like, you know, so. <laughs> it's not glamorous, is it? Being on the road. Oh my God. And some of the comedians you have to work with, it's like, yeah. Oh yeah. Tell us stuff. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> name names. <laughs> or don't name names. Just tell stories. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't know if you want to know about, oh, some of the, yeah, just some of the comedians are just, I don't know, comedy. I think maybe it's the entertainment industry. There's a lot of mental health going on. A lot of addiction kind of doesn't help that I'm a nurse too, because I'm always diagnosing people and I'm like, yeah, you need medication. Also, I'm just going to do the set and leave. <laughs> like, you know, I'm just like. We were talking to Alison Dorr and she led us to you. We're very grateful for that. But she was talking about, again, she's had her own struggles with mental health and addiction. And why is it that comedy, especially professional comedians, go hand in hand or arm in arm in arm with mental health and addiction? And she suggested, and I, re I really think this is an interesting point, that comedy is a coping mechanism, that it saves you, but it also sadly puts you, it's like going to group therapy for being a sex addict, and they put you in a room with a bunch of other sex addicts. I know, but the problem is you're like, you're having this mental issue, and then you're using comedy as a coping mechanism, but then like, it's like, where's the help in that space? It's like not a, really a safe space. If you're not dealing with a mental illness and you're not actually getting help for it and you're just using it as that, it's not a good idea. Well, she's kind of an unusual example, but Hannah Gadsby, like, I don't know whether everyone would call her a comedian because a lot of people say she's not funny. She's just talking about don't make fat jokes or don't make lesbian jokes or don't, you know, that's not, that's not funny. Like, yeah, I'm, I might be a little bit heavy and I might be a lesbian, but that's not why I'm funny. I'm funny because I'm funny and let me just do that. But she brought out the whole, so I don't know, like for her, it was coping because then I saw her next routine after the let's not just have overweight people make overweight jokes anymore. And her next routine was like, I'm just going to be funny. So she I don't know. It, it did seem to help her, Maureen, I guess. Yeah, no, no, I, I don't object to it. It's better than drugs, you know. Yeah, there's still a lot of you go to the clubs, there's a lot of alcohol there. There's a lot of drugs there. Like I seen some comics like have breakdowns on stage and like who's there to like you know, tell them like, oh, maybe you should step back. Maybe you should do this. Maybe you should do that. You know what I mean? Well, you're the nurse. So therefore you're, <laughs> you're responsible for everybody. You're the nurse. <laughs> Get Sabrina in here. <laughs> so I saw one of your routines, which I th I've seen just a couple of them, you know, on YouTube, whatever. But there's one where you talk about your seven-year-old daughter, and maybe it's the same one that you mentioned earlier of her saying, hey, mom, what's a period? And you you go through this whole thing about when to lie and when not to lie, which, you know, I went through that with my daughter at a certain age. But like, tell us about that. Like, how do you figure out at what age do you tell everything and at what age do you lie? Because my mom, 
my mom was terrible. Like when I said, is there really a Santa Claus? Instead of saying, of course, there's a Santa Claus. But like most normal parents, she was like, well, what do you think? I'm not going to lie to you, so, <laughs> which most normal people think is like severely abnormal. So how do you find the, the line of what to tell your kids? Oh, man. Like the way I was raised, my parents just always told me straight up. They told me there was no Santa Claus and they're buying the gifts. They want all the credit. They're like, no, I spent my money. I worked. You're getting the presents for me. There's no Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I don't know. I didn't care. I was so young. I was like, whatever. Because I used to be like, what's that jingling at the door? They're like, no, 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 no. You're getting two gifts and it's from me. <laughs> Well, that's how our daughter figured it out was, how come you and Santa have the same wrapping paper? Hmm, busted. <laughs> I figured that out. I figured that out because I had separate wrapping paper for the gifts that went under the tree on Christmas Eve. Because, yeah, kids are smart. But the other, I remember, since we're on the topic, I was driving downtown and I had Aiden, who was probably about six in the back, six or seven. He was with his friend. Little John, remember his name, Little John. It's like Robin Hood, right? <laughs> and Little John said to Aiden, do we still believe in Santa? I thought this was pretty cute. And Aiden's response was, oh, yeah, you get more gifts if you do. <laughs> they know. Oh, they know. Yeah, they know. Oh, yeah. So what did you tell her about the period? <laughs> that period story is honestly a joke. I didn't tell her all that. It's totally... <laughs> <laughs> all jokes are fabricated. I can't make it a real thing. And then people will just be like, ah, so I just made it into this. Stuff. But it, like, it took me years to develop that story based on what people laugh at and what they don't. But like, it's just like the period, man. I just, I'll just never forget. Like when she was having her period, I tried to make it an exciting time for her <laughs> by buying her a fanny pack. I was like, look at this fanny pack. You can put your pads and wipes in them when you go to school. She's like, mom, like, you know. It's a wonderful time for you. My sister is nine years younger than me. And when so I was a teenager and she was still a little kid and she was reading, Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. Remember that book about a little girl who just prays to God that she'll get her period? She was about seven. And I said, do you know what a period is, Katie? And she said, yeah, when you get your period, your nails get long and you get hair on your bum. I thought, well, that's, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, close enough. You'll figure it out. Yeah, we You'll had uh, marijuana cookies hidden in the back of our freezer, and I'm sure everything was legal. And when our daughter was little, she would ask us, you know, we would say, no, don't do drugs. Drugs are drugs are not good because you're seven. Like drugs, no, don't do drugs. Not now, anyway. Yeah. And then, you know, as she got older, she discovered a few things around the house, and she was like, oh. And I said, well, I never actually lied. I was just creative. It is difficult knowing what to say and what not to say. I mean, Santa aside. So, yeah, my husband was like, let's get the boots and the flower and we'll have Santa's footprints. And our daughter was like all over that. Oh, that's too much work for me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, forget about it. <laughs> like, But she loved it. And then she grew out of it. when We got busted. I want to go back to asking you, in all seriousness, you talked about different jokes for different audiences. So, I mean... Is it black and white to put it baldly or there? I mean, I, I get that, too. You always tailor your material to what you think people are going to respond to, you know, in terms of like making jokes about patience and so on. But specifically, because you're part of the you're part of Kenny Robinson's uh, troupe, the Nubian show. So you're going to definitely that is going to be a very and, and he's hilarious. And all of the comics associated with that are, are amazing. But it's going to be a different show than when you're doing a corporate gig. Oh, yeah. One hundred and ten percent. The Nubian show is just like a lot of Caribbean people that can totally relate to my material. So I'm talking about a lot of Caribbean stuff. But even though it depends, like sometimes if I do a yucks gig, there will be people who, especially Americans. I remember I met this American couple. I forgot where they're from. Somewhere down south. And they're like, we love Jamaican jokes. I'm like, how do you understand this? There are no Jamaican people in like, in South Carolina, what? <laughs> I'm like, okay, sure. They're like, yes, tell us more. But like, it depends. Like, you can't, you can't really look at a crowd and know what they want. You kind of got to try a little bit. Like the period joke, I, I have a little bit of my 
dad's accent in it. And if they really laugh at it, I'm like, okay, I'll try my other Jamaican jokes. But if they don't really laugh at it at all, I'll keep it more like, you know, about my kids, about work or like whatever. Or like I have like a little bit of material about old people. Let's see how far I can take it kind of situation. And you can actually feel the vibe of the room if they're not feeling something or not. And then I'll just change whatever I'm saying. Or like if the comedian goes on before me, if they're not really liking certain stuff, I'll be like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Like a really young crowd might not like my kids material, but sometimes they do. I don't know. It's weird. Like, it's just like, you just have to guess. <laughs> Someone I know who does speeches and is quasi famous or whatever says that the the real trick, and I, I assume it would be the same in humor and in, in stand-up, That it's all about confidence. It's about the crowd accepting that you're in charge and that you're taking them somewhere. But that's easy to say. It's hard to create. Oh, yeah. You have to like be super confident and just believe that you're telling the best joke in the whole entire world. And you have to kind of like trick the audience to where like at the beginning of your set, you start with little jokes. So you get the laughter so frequent that by the time you tell your other jokes, they're going to be laughing anyway, even if it's not that funny. It's kind of like, it's weird. You have to get get the laughter consistent. Like every few seconds, they should be laughing. Like you should be having your punchlines that they're doing that. So then all of a sudden it's like a rhythm and they're laughing at whatever you say anyways. It's like, oh my God, it's like math. It's math. <laughs> well, it's like an algorithm. Yeah. <laughs> like if you don't get them laughing within the, first few seconds of your set it's going to be harder to make them laugh so it's you have to get them right off the top to trust you it's like they don't trust you there's this new person on stage they're like are you funny but i mean if you're already like somebody that they know like they've seen you on tv or they know you from other shows then they're already going to be laughing it's so easy but then what do you do what do you do if you don't get them at the beginning then do you just sort of like hang your head in shame and shuffle off the stage Oh, then it's, it's an uphill struggle. You're like, okay, uh, okay, I have kids. I got anybody got kids? Like you're trying to relate to them. They're like, <laughs> got twenty bucks. <laughs> oh, I'm like, oh shit. Okay, I guess I'm just gonna be talking for the rest of this set. All right, yeah. Sabrina, you are a treat. You really are. We can find you through Howl and Roar Records. Thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, it's been lovely to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. She makes it seem so easy, but just towards the end of our talk, when she was talking about seeding the audience with jokes and seeing if she gets the... I mean, this is one of the reasons why I've never been remotely interested in doing stand-up, because if you don't have them from the get-go, you're probably not going to get them, and you're out there for 10 minutes of sweat and depression. Yeah, it's funny. I went to see yesterday, I was at Louise Penny's event for the launch of her book, and there were a lot of questions. And she was talking about how she writes drafts. And it's the same thing as as being a a stand-up comedian is that you spend, and she says, I will spend probably weeks, if not months, sitting, staring into space, and people will think I'm doing absolutely nothing. But I'm just playing in my head. And it's the same thing. It's like, try this, it's not working. Try this, it's not working. And but in stand-up, you do it before a live audience. And if it doesn't work, it's like, oh, my God, it would be horrifying. I've seen a couple of Sabrina's things on YouTube. I haven't seen her in person, unfortunately. And in most of them, she gets the audience going. But in one, it was like, it was a little, a little awkward. It's freaking hard. Yeah, I've seen some of the best comedians bomb. And then you'll come back and they'll do the same material three nights later. And the whole room will just completely lap it up. So, I mean, there are people that are funnier than others and other people that handle that situation better, but so much depends on the mood of the crowd or the makeup of the crowd and whether it was raining that day or, you know, whether you got a parking ticket, so much can affect your show. Yeah. And I guess as she was saying, as you were saying, it depends so much on the crowd too, right? Because a corporate crowd is different from a different performance. And she talked a lot about, oh, I was shocked a little bit about you know, a crowd that'll get Jamaican references or or jokes and the corporate crowd that may not get those, but sometimes they do. We didn't ask her about, because one thing that I was, now that I'm no longer 40, well, I still think I'm 40, but she talks about old people being in their 50s. And I'm like, whoa, (laughs) let's just hope that was a very young audience. But (laughs) yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I won't tell anybody that you're not 40 or that you windsurf. Apparently, those are secrets we take to the grave. (laughs) Oh, top secret, top secret. Yes. 
Anyway, I got to go because I'm really super busy, okay? I don't know. I, I think you just like to say that you're busy. <laughs> I like to be busy. I'm busier. <laughs> I'm busier. Uh, it's lovely to talk to you. Lovely to talk to her. I, she's, she's great. So can't wait. And yeah, we'll talk yeah. again soon. Yes, we will. The Women of Ill Repute with Wendy Mesley and Maureen Holloway. Available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or at womenofillrepute.com. Produced and distributed by the Sound Off Media Company.